Remember only positive things. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Social and Economic Progress, a very warm welcome to all of you today in this discussion. I want to particularly welcome and thank our, our esteemed panelists. Yesterday, somebody messaged me saying, wow, what a rock star panel. And actually, it is indeed quite the rock star panel. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, a collection of, I mean, it's an enviable a pool of knowledge and expertise and insights on what's happening in health uh, in the country, both at the national level and specific to some states. Uh, so I, I'm really looking forward to this discussion and I'm sure everybody else is as well. Let me quickly introduce our guest. I'll start from that side, Dr. Indrani Gupta, who's a professor at the Institute of Economic Growth and head of the uh, Health Policy Unit. Um, Mr. C.K. Mishra, who's been secretary, well, most recently uh, secretary, Ministry of Environment, but before that, secretary health, and uh, also um, um, Department of Health in uh, Bihar. Um, sorry, I think Rajiv needs uh, directions, perhaps. Uh, Ms. Girija Vedanathan, former Chief Secretary, uh, Government of Tamil Nadu, before that Health Secretary, Government of Tamil Nadu, and Dr. Nachiket Moore, who's a visiting scientist at the Banyan Academy of Leadership in Mental Health, as well as a commissioner with the Lancet Commission on Reimagining India's Health System. Uh, Rajiv is on his way, uh, so in his absence, let me introduce him. Uh, Rajiv Sadanandan is former additional Chief Secretary Health Government of uh, Kerala. So as you can see, we have very, very varied experience, national level and some key states, um, uh, which should add a lot of color to this discussion. What we are going to focus on today is how health is financed. Where are the expenditures on health coming from? And this has been a... It's been a conversation that has happened for long, much of it around two separate strands. One is why is public spending on health so low in India, which is has indeed, it's moved, but it's moved very, very slowly. And at the same time, uh, you know, why are out-of-pocket expenditures so high? So these have been the two strands. What we decided to look uh, at is the association between the two. Um, not in terms of causal relationships, but look at how the trends in public health expenditure have moved and in what way does that align or not with the trends in out-of-pocket expenditure. And to see um, what might be mediating the two. So in particular, we, we are looking at the utilization of services, public versus private, to see when we look at these three variables, is there a coherent story that is emerging out of this in terms of as the trends, as we see increasing public health expenditure, uh, do we see declining out-of-pocket expenditures, et cetera? Um, you know, the recent national health accounts came out and there was a discourse at that point that GHE has gone up and accordingly out-of-pocket has come down. Uh, so we're just trying to see what is happening in particular in India's very, very uh, diverse context because each state is different. We see in some states uh, the government expenditure is very high, in other states not so much. So how, well, is that and how is that translating in terms of uh, out-of-pocket expenditure? Um, so we're, you know, we've spent a few months um, doing some analysis on this issue and we're going to uh, share that analysis and then we're going to ask a few questions of our panelists, questions that we were, you know, not very clear on as we did that analysis and, and we hope to deepen the thinking through this discussion. Before we start, I just want to lay out three or four caveats, if I can call, call it that. One, as I mentioned, we are, we are not looking at this as causal. We are not saying that, uh, you know, increase in GHE is the cause of, let's say, decrease in OP, because we understand OP, it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, variable and, and many issues contribute to that. Uh, we're looking at whether there's some relationship or not, how the trends have moved uh, um, uh, together. The, the second is that um, we've, 
the data that we use, which is NSSO, the last data set we have is 2017-18, and it's been five years since then. So we do recognize that the world has moved in the last five years. So it may well happen that some of you may feel that the data that is being presented, well, that's not quite the situation right now, and that's fine. Please point it out. Uh, but you know, the reality is that there isn't a more recent data set. So that's the second. Um, the, the third issue is that what we've done is we've used um, per capita, as we are looking at government health expenditure, as we are looking at out-of-pocket expenditure, there are many different ways of doing it. We've chosen to look at it in terms of per capita expenditure. Other researchers have seen it in terms of percentage of GDP, percentage of THE, et cetera. There is no right or wrong. There are many different ways of doing it, and it's complex no matter how you look at it. Uh, so what would also be useful if our panelists would share with us, you know, the pros and cons of one methodology versus another, and Alok will talk to this more. Um, and there was a fourth one, which is now uh, slipping my mind, doesn't matter. So um, those are some of the caveats. And with that, I was actually going to request Lavish Bhandari, who's our president, to say some welcoming words, but Lavish, um, thought this was at the Habitat Center because, uh, Rajiv, come, please come, because that's where our, another recent seminar was, so he'll, he'll be here in a few minutes. But let's start, and I would request um, Alok Kumar Singh, who's um, research associate at CSEP, to share some of the key sort of findings that, that we've come up with. Uh, after which we're going to uh, maybe try and ask some tough questions of our, our panelists. Um, welcome, Rajiv. Um, welcome. welcome, yeah. We just finished with welcome and a little bit of context setting, but you know it also. I don't have to say anything. Okay, um, Alok, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Sandhya has mentioned that uh, we have mainly focused on trends between uh, health expenditure and health seeking behavior. So uh, the key objective of the study, uh, yeah. So the key objective of the study uh, was to understand if uh, there is, uh, uh, there have been links between the movements in public health expenditure and that in the out of pocket expenditure. And to address the objectives, the key questions that we have identified uh, was to. Uh, see whether there is an association between public health expenditure and out-of-pocket expenditure and whether the association is mediated through public facility utilization. That is if public health expenditure is associated to increase in public facility utilization and uh, declining in out-of-pocket expenditure. Next is, yeah. So the data sources we mainly use, as Sandhya mentioned, was national sample survey data uh, for 2004, 14 and 18. And uh, for out-of-pocket expenditure and uh, uh, public facility utilization, public and private facility utilization, and national health account reports for uh, government health expenditure per capita, and rural health statistics and national health profile data for uh, infrastructure development, and uh, additionally IPS report on out-of-pocket expenditure to get uh, the standardized OOP across the three years, 2004, 14, and 18, and uh, both GHE and OOP per capita have been used at 2018 prices. Uh, uh, the method of analysis was mainly uh, the descriptive statistics to um, uh, examine the strength of association between the three key variables and the uh, findings of the uh, descriptive statistics was triangulated with uh, simple linear regressions between the uh, key variables. As Santa mentioned that we have uh, preferred per capita uh, health expenditure for both GHE and OOP over uh, GHE is percent of GSDP and OOP is percent of THE because um, initially we started with GHE is percent of GSDP and OOP is percent of THE but what we found is for example uh, uh, for during 2014 and 18 there were three st uh, some states like Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Karnataka where it showed that GHE has not moved. Uh, there was no change in GHE but in terms of per capita GHE we found that there was considerable increase for this period. And similarly for OOP as percent of THE, uh, for example, uh, Himachal Pradesh uh, showed that there was decline in OOP as percent of THE, but in terms of per capita OOP, it was actually increased during that period. So um, it was not giving us the true impression about the cost of healthcare. So uh, that was the reason actually, so uh, to choose per capita health expenditure uh, over percentage GSDP and THE. So now we present uh, some of the findings. Uh, so as you can see that as um, 
government health expenditure increased over the years uh, during 2004 to 18 across all the states but still it is uh, variable across the state uh, whereas in terms of op uh, you see that it increased during 4 to 14 but then it decreased between 40, 14 and 18 and during 4 to 18 you will see that there is a slight increase in uh, overall mean op per capita so uh, what we found is that while GHE increased with increasing GHE, you see there is a slight increase in OOP during the same period. Uh, in order to understand whether uh, whether the infrastructure uh, has had a role to play uh, in the association, uh, we found that public health infrastructure has increased across all the level of care, but uh, primarily the focus was on the secondary and tertiary care. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, when we see the association between uh, GHE per capita and uh, uh, human resources, that is doctors, availability of doctors in primary health centers and community health centers, we didn't find any association between the two. So uh, the, top, the top row, the two graphs, the right two graphs are uh, for uh, uh, doctors in TSCs and CSCs. Uh, and uh, the second and third row is uh, the shortfall in uh, mainly primary health care. So you see that with increasing GHG per capita, the shortfall has decreased. Uh, uh, so there is a uh, positive association between uh, uh, increasing GHG and availability of primary uh, public health infrastructure. Now we uh, look into the uh, utilization of public facilities. So whether infrast increase in infrastructure has played any role in uh, utilization of public facilities and we found that uh, with increasing uh, public health infrastructure, uh, public facility utilization for both inpatient and outpatient has increased across uh, 2004, 14, and 18. Um, but we found that, uh, you'll see, uh, for the EAG states, uh, we found that interestingly, the, the increase in uh, inpatient utilization was mainly for childbirth. Uh, when we exclude for childbirth, we see that. Uh, the inpatient utilization was decreased for uh, most of the EAG states. And uh, similarly for outpatient, so in, in outpatient utilization, uh, you see even the majority of the states seen increasing outpatient utilization uh, with uh, increasing GHE per capita. Uh, but still, um, the overall utilization of outpatient is lower for majority of majority of the states. It is less than forty percent for most of the states. So, uh, so, uh, so the red dots are basically for EAG states, and the blue dots are for non-EAG states. Okay. So to recap, uh, what we have seen till this uh, slide is that increasing GHE has been associated with increasing uh, infrastructure, and also with increasing public facility utilization. However, we don't see any association with uh, human resources. So now we look at the implications of this on OOP. So as we have seen that government inpatient utilization has increased uh, for most of the states, but overall mean OP per capita due to inpatient has not decreased for, for most of the states. Uh, yeah. So the next question is, so yeah, so, uh, uh, but we have, uh, when we looked at OP due to inpatient in government facilities, we have seen that it has decreased, but overall mean OP per capita has not decreased for most of the states. And similarly for outpatient utilization, you will see that uh, the, the trend is similar with increasing outpatient utilization, your uh, mean OOP due to outpatient has not decreased for most of the states. There are outliers like Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand, Gujarat, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka and Maharashtra where you will see the mean OOP per capita due to outpatient has decreased. But for most of the states it has, it has increased. So now we want to return to, uh, we have uh, in, in, in the fifth slide we have said that uh, OOP has actually decreased during 2014 to 18. Um, and um, uh, we saw that the public facility utilization has actually increased uh, during this period. Uh, uh, so the increase in government utilization is definitely one of the explanation behind drop in OOP. 
but uh, you will see you see that that uh, the overall utilization of hospitalization has decreased during uh, 2014 and 18 and that could be another possibility behind drop in oop but this needs to be examined carefully because we have like it's it's, a, it's suggestive of dropping oop this includes staying yeah overall yeah so what we found is that OOP is not merely the function of private facilities, but also the function of public facilities. Uh, so you will see that when we disaggregate uh, OOP component, we found that medicine and diagnostics were, so, were not shown, shown diagnostics here, but medicine and diagnostics both are uh, the great, uh, greater contributing factor for increase in OOP, uh, both in government and in, in private facilities. So this is mainly, we, this data is for inpatient, but for both inpatient and outpatient, you will see that medicine and diagnostics has a greater role to play in overall OOP. Now the question is uh, whether economic uh, uh, status of the state plays any role in uh, uh, health seeking behavior. Uh, so we found that, uh, this is for inpatient utilization, so we found that uh, as GSDB per capita increases, private inpatient utilization also increases. You can see that uh, the red dots are for EAG and, and the blue dots are for non-EAG. So as GSD per capita increases, your private inpatient utilization also increases. Uh, but you don't see the similar trend in outpatient. So uh, in case of outpatient, you will see uh, private outpatient utilization is, uh, is, considered, is higher for most of the states irrespective of GSD per capita. Yeah, so now uh, this is important. Uh, so we find that most high income states have high public expenditure on health on the one hand, but low utilization of public facilities and uh, respective high OOP. Uh, we also find that mean OOP has a weak association with uh, GSDB per capita, which reinforces the point that it is not only due to private facilities, but it is also being incurred in government facilities. Uh, as compared to uh, uh, so as compared to EAG states, uh, we also we find that most of the high income states except Punjab and Maharashtra have high G, high GHE per capita, uh, and in terms of facility utilization, almost high almost all high income states except Himachal and Tamil Nadu have high private outpatient utilization and high uh, private inpatient utilization. Uh, in terms of OOP, except Gujarat and Karnataka, high income states have higher OOP than EAG states. So uh, in case of Kerala and Tamil Nadu, we found uh, the interesting fact was, uh, you will see that the shortfall in infrastructure and human resources is lower than most of the states. Uh, but despite that, private facility utilization, in, especially in Kerala, is higher for both in, inpatient and outpatient. So uh, uh, when we look at the literature, we found that uh, one of the major factors for lower utilization of government facilities is the quality and uh, quality of provisioning in public facilities and long waiting time. Uh, in case of Tamil Nadu, we have seen interestingly OOP is very low. Uh, I mean, as compared to all other states for both inpatient and outpatient, it is in government facilities especially. Uh, uh, the OOP is very low, but despite that, uh, the utilization of private facilities is considerably higher, as in uh, around 46 to 49 percent for both inpatient and outpatient. So based on uh, our analysis, we can say that uh, neither increase in public uh, expenditure nor increase in public facility utilization has been associated with declining out of pocket expenditure. But uh, when we run the regression analysis and we have also checked with uh, unit level data and we found that uh, when we increase GHE per capita significantly, it leads to greater outpatient utilization and which has, uh, which, which has the potential to reduce OOP. So based on our analysis, we, uh, we we can say that there is need to increase GHE significantly. First, second, uh, there is need to focus on primary healthcare as we have seen that the focus has been mo mo mainly on the secondary healthcare. And also we need to identify the levers to shift the health sitting behavior, uh, especially in non-AG states. Uh, and also there is need 
uh, of a better targeting of uh, public expenditure and increase the accountability to decrease out of pocket expenditure thank you Sorry. Uh, um, well, I won't give my opening remarks, but I will just. I, I've been, uh, of course, following all the work that we have been doing, and uh, it's it's really great to see all of you here. I mean, it's this is a very young program, and uh, it's taking enormous strides. Uh, but in the process, there are some thoughts that have been emerging. I mean, I have worked on 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 health issues in the past. And the question is essentially related to that when we will have this discussion, I'm sure this is going to be a really, really great discussion. The solutions to the problems are known, the solutions are known. But essentially the systems that we have, sorry, the systems that we have are not correcting themselves. So the problem really, I mean all of these that we, that we study, the problems of the outcomes and, and, and outputs and so on, are more related to the lack of our ability to build self-correcting systems. And so the issue then, I mean, again, I mean, if you go further there, I mean, is it a problem that information is not flowing across the system? Is it a problem that uh, you don't have flexibilities assigned at the right nodes in this system? Or is it just an issue of accountability and, uh, and incentives? Uh, of course, the safe answer is that all of these matter. but. Uh, sometimes by just changing one or two elements, the rest can also be addressed. So just, these are thoughts, I'm not really saying that I have the solutions and so on, but just something that's, I mean, these thoughts have been growing the more I, I, I read uh, some of our work. I won't take any more uh, of, of, this, of this audience's time, but this is really, really exciting. Our work is really exciting and uh, the contributions that you give to us add further energy to it. So thank you, look forward to this. So with that, um, we're going to move to a discussion with our panelists. And the discussion is in the form of um, specific questions. Feel free to you know, um, comment on anything that you've heard. But we have some specific questions. And while the questions are for a particular person, if anybody else wants to comment, uh, feel free to do that by raising your hand or, or anything. I'm going to begin with um, Girija ji. Um, Girija in Tamil Nadu, um, use of private facilities for inpatient care has been high, right? Uh, it's been higher than um, uh, states like Rajasthan, Odisha, MP, etc. Uh, despite high growth in GHE and a focus on building public infrastructure, why does private inpatient facility, why is private inpatient facility high? Uh, you know, Tamil Nadu is known for a good public health system. And before you respond, I just want to say that there is a school of thought that believes that a good public health system creates greater demand for medical services which sometimes leads people to, to access private services. Do you think this is a case of that or it's a bit of an erroneous <laughs> school of thought? Uh, I think my, many of the questions were answered there also and you have mentioned a part of the answer here. The fact is that Tamil Nadu has a very good private healthcare system also and it has a reasonably good public healthcare system. And for the record, between the 71st and the 75th round with the, uh, the NSSO, uh, with the caveat that the 75th round needs to be read and interpreted with caution because it was not as good as the rounds that went before it. We went up from 34% utilization of public sector in uh, for inpatient care to 49%. So there was a s substantial increase, but I'm not going to count on that as a real answer because I think that that 
only when we get the next NSSO, which is something like waiting for a, uh, a heavenly, uh, you know, event to occur. It's still not there in the horizon. Uh, but there has been increase. But I agree with you that it is not commensurate. Why, why is it not? For instance, what happened in uh, Tamil Nadu in childbirth in uh, in uh, public health uh, using delivery services in public sector was because we introduced certain things, certain changes, and there's a. Lit a list of changes that were done, including a uh, maternity benefit scheme that was only eligible for those who went to the public sector. A little bit of hand twisting. So you gave them 12,000 rupees if they went to the public system. We went up substantially. We're somewhere around 70% uh, now in the, and there were like a 15% increase over uh, five years. Uh, use of the public system for delivery care went up substantially. We, we are seeing this in this NSSO, but I said in the absence of further evidence, I will not count on that. I agree with you that there is definitely what was put up here, drivers of choice of private health care. Once private health care is not available, because if we are compared to the EAG states, very often it's a question of not having choice. There is no alternative. Here, there is an alternative. And uh, our studies show that there are all kinds of alternatives. I mean, the word private healthcare is not just the corporate hospitals. It's the tiny guy with a with a one-man, five-bedded five clinic to the thing. So the person looks, and as you rightly said, waiting times, perception about government, everything is there. So the person with just enough uh, money to go to the private sector goes to the private sector. We also have an excellent transportation system. And I think that's adding to the fact that I can reach the near town without batting an eyelid so I don't have to rely on this so people and the what so the worrisome feature is not only that 40 percent are accessing private health care it is if you take a quintile wise analysis even the poorest it is roughly about 40 percent who are reaching private health care so there is some work to be done uh, and there uh, the as you have pointed out many times I have discussed with you also this that it is not just increasing government expenditure there's no direct pathway between just increase, and that's in all the literature. You can't increase government health expenditure and expect that everything is going to set itself right. And Professor Bandari also pointed it out. There are many answers that we all know. The pathway is not at all direct. One way is by increasing infrastructure, there are places to go. And you also, I'm going to answer the next part on why the OOP is not coming down. But this is, as soon as people can afford it, they choose to find private health care if it is available. We believe that if this 34% to 49% shown in this period is correct, we might be somewhere around there. We might be around 50 to 50, 55%. But as I said, our work should be to make sure that no one uh, cannot afford health care. Because what is going to happen if they can't go to private health care? And the, I will be presenting some of the numbers. The difference, Tamil Nadu is a, is a stark contrast of the public and the private sector. And I will be answering that in the next question. But it is so stark. In other states, the range is not so stark. In our state, the range is really stark. So it is, as she says, extremely surprising that people are choosing to go to private health care. But my answer is that because it's available, as soon as people can think they can afford it, they move. They they move, they go and uh, choose to do it. If it were not at all available, perhaps they would be stuck with us. That's that's the answer. Thank you. We will come back to the question of choosing. But just one quick point. You mentioned the um, uh, income quintile-wise analysis, and, and we did try to do that. And for both Kerala and Tamil Nadu, we find the gap between the poorest and the richest is actually not very high. So yeah. exactly to the point that, that yeah, we, you were we've making. Yeah, we've been doing that for yeah. every NSSO, and that's what it yeah. shows. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mishra, I was... I was first going to ask you a question on only Bihar, but I'm going to club Bihar and UP together as they often are. This first round of questions is state specific because you all have insights on specific states, and then we'll ask um, a second round more general. So in Bihar, both sorry, both Bihar and UP have low GSDP, um, and yet private facility use is high, right? Um, for outpatient, one could assume um, that. It is a lot of the informal providers. But even for inpatient, Bihar has higher pri private facility use than states like Chhattisgarh, Odisha, West Bengal, Assam, etc. Um, what are your thoughts on why that is happening? And we had a chart where we showed we tried to do this analysis of uh, looking at whether the state income level is related to private use. And we found that as states go higher up the income level, private use increases. But in Bihar, both for Bihar and UP, that hypothesis is not quite panning out. So would like to hear your thoughts. 
Excellent. I, I thought I'll first respond to the issue of op uh, I mean, out of pocket, sure. but I'll let that be for the next oh, question. Go ahead. Let, let me just talk about what okay. you mentioned. Let me take off from where Girija left, and you mentioned that in Bihar and UP, uh, private sector access is better than a public sector access. Yes, it is, because a system has to exist for anybody to access it. If there is no system existing in the right kind of quantity, people will go somewhere. Number one. Number two, I don't know why we always get so unduly worried about private and public. If access to healthcare is there without increasing the level of poverty or without shooting up the out of pocket, why are we honestly getting so worked up on whether X is accessing a public facility or a private facility? Girija just said that, you know, if you pay 12,000 for maternal benefit, you can go anywhere. So what you're doing effectively is empowering that person to seek health care at an appropriate place that he likes. This is not happening in Bihar and UP. Okay. okay. So now, I, in fact, let me just get back. I was reading this morning an article by Bivek Debroy. He's argued basically about the multidimensional poverty index report. And he says the Bimaru states, which is largely Bihar and UP, I think, I mean, we, we can now drop the rest for a while. So, Bihar includes Jharkhand. Bihar, Bihar includes Jharkhand. It's, it's, like, it's like the legal documents which say he includes she. So, you know, Bihar in UP, and he's argued in that article that the actual fact is that the deprivation levels have come down in this state. And his second argument is that it's not income. He says it's not income. It is targeted government schemes which have been implemented properly in UP which has led to this. So his argument is that as the deprivation goes further down, the, um, um, there will be a definite improvement in health indicators. Mm -hmm. Also because the base is very low, so the jump will be quantum. Mm -hmm. Let's not get into that. So the point is that Bihar and UP traditionally have been sta states where access to healthcare has been poor. Now, one of the reasons largely has been that for decades, these states have depended on central funding for their healthcare provision. You know, on a budget paper, you see a lot of money being spent here and there. But if you carefully examine that, both states have thrived on NHM. And their expenditure of the state budget has largely been on personnel in the medical colleges so on and so forth. Situation in Bihar changed during the period 2009-14, so to say, where the locked up PSCs and the sub-centers opened up again and people started going to the public health facilities. Now, let me make a caveat here. You know, when you talk about people accessing public health care and when you make that point about the health expenditure going up. Let us also remember that your second point about health seeking behavior. I mean, let us remember that that ex we need to carefully examine where was that expenditure made. Look at the last decades expenditure on health. Large portion of the expenditure is on secondary and tertiary care. And health seeking behavior is about primary health care. Mm. So we need to keep this distinction mm. in mind when we are talking about it. So nine, 2009 to 14, for example, Bihar, the footfalls increased. And the only reason was because there was a doctor to examine them. 
and there was very good availability of drugs and diagnostics. Slowly as we went along, and this is a story with many states, the diagnostic part which was outsourced to the private sector crashed because we did not have a proper system in place. The drug availability reduced and therefore even with the infrastructure that was created, the access to public health facilities reduced. But we cannot deny, even in Bihar and UP, that access to public health facilities has had a huge impact on whether it is the MMR, IMR, NMR, whatever you want to say. I don't see that private sector has played a huge role in these basic indicators. But when you calculate your out-of-pocket, Hmm. It matters. Hmm. Now, if you are out of pocket, the largest portion is drugs and diagnostics. Hmm. Then what are you talking about? You are talking about a state like Bihar or UP being strong on a delivery system. It's not about facility creation. It's not about spending money. It's about a delivery system. And unfortunately, in these two states, that delivery system has been weak. Therefore, I don't see a direct connect between GHE and, GHE and, 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 and access. There may be in terms of infrastructure creation and expansion. So if, a, yeah. I mean, for, in Tamil Nadu, for example, mobility is not a problem. In Bihar, UP, in certain areas, mobility may be a problem. So, health-seeking behavior will depend on how far you have to travel. So, what really matters, and the rest of the issues, if you, you want me to cover the health-seeking no. behavior right now? As you like. Okay. So, now, health-seeking behavior and expenditure. So, actually, let me just complete Bihar and UP first. So, what Bihar and UP need is not just higher spend. They need two critical elements. They need to improve the delivery mechanism at the primary health care level because I always feel that government's responsibility lies 100% in providing primary health care, preventive, promotive health care. We are seeing the opposite in recent times when more expenditure is being made on creating tertiary centers of excellence, etc., etc., my theory always has been, in particularly in states where affluence is low, every pie of expenditure should go on ensuring that a person doesn't fall sick rather than investing in sick care later. That concept is not happening, will not happen in UP and Bihar because it is not politically referral, I mean, uh, relevant as to what expenditure you make on primary health care, it does not reflect in acceptance and votes. So therefore, the story has changed in those states. So you need to create a good delivery mechanism there. And I think as a, uh, the second thing that we need to do is try and see how much of penetration we can get from the private sector into our rural areas. It can't be one. The kind of population that resides in these two states can't be one, particularly when you are talking about NCDs, etc. Now, access. I mean, converting a sub-center into a health and wellness center does not increase either footfall or health-seeking behavior or proper treatment. Doesn't, doesn't naturally convert to that. No, it does only if you do it right. What is the first point? Let, let, let me now throw a question. What is the first point of contact for a person in Bihar or UP in a remote rural area? Quack. The quack. Perhaps for many it's the last point of contact also. But we just want to turn a blind eye to that huge mass of resource, however maligned, that we have and we don't want to use it in our system. We want to just outright reject it. Fair call. But if Bihar and UP want to reject that system and tell people that you cannot go to a quack, 
they necessarily need to build facilities for them. You can't just say that you can't go there, but I don't have a place. So it means huge investment, it means private sector, and it means more than anything else, a good delivery system which can reach out. I think the rest of the issues are come on next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mishra, this is really useful. Um, Rajiv, I was actually going to ask you a question on Kerala and the spirit of the first set being uh, state-based, but um, uh, we'll do that later. No, uh, the tragedy of Bihar, Sandhya, is that it's always surrounded by Tamil Nadu and <laughs> Kerala. And you start comparing Bihar UP to Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Uh, uh, Sandhya, just since uh, CK raised some issue, I just wanted to highlight this thing that government health expenditure not being one monolith, but going elsewhere. We did an analysis once and tried to do it back of the envelope type calculations. And while it does go up almost uniformly, every the bulk seems to come from tertiary care, these new building of the new hospitals. And even schemes like an insurance scheme or a maternity benefit scheme, like he says, is not going to impact either access or uh, OOP directly. So the direct linkage is, it's the pathway is very complex. I just want to say we did it and we saw that increase in GHE is much more complex than than we think. Indrani, were you saying something? No. Okay. I would say that yes, she's saying. Yes. Have the last word. Yes. Okay. So I want to build on on what Mishra, Mr. Mishra said and and uh, what you just said, Girija, as well. That it's not about the quantum of money; it's about where that money is going. Uh, and for example, the extent of uh, focus on secondary, tertiary, uh, rather than primary. Um, we also showed in one of the slides that while infrastructure increased, uh, but the health workforce didn't really increase, right? So that's another point apart from the focus on secondary. So Rajiv, um, to now forget Kerala for a minute, but just looking at oh, India I? as a whole, <laughs> I know it's hard to forget <laughs> Kerala. Um, would you say, I mean, to what extent would you say that the reason for a lot of people accessing private care, and I will come back to what's the problem with private, there is no problem, but we'll come back to that, uh, is because um, the public investments have gone in one direction, but not really looked at what else is needed in order to effectively use the investments that have been made. So for example, if the money has been used to create infrastructure, but if the, if the, health, if the doctors are not there and the med medical supplies are not there, uh, then that is not useful. So to your mind, um, to what extent has that impacted um, the, let's say, the suboptimal use of public services and the move towards private? I have uh, problems with framing this whole discussion around a linear uh, link between a government health expenditure and uh, and the consumption pattern. The framework I would use uh, I would use would be a, a theory of market. This is essentially a, a essentially a kind of uh, a market function that is happening, and all the factors that that Professor Indrani would normally use for analysis of the market is what I think we need to be looked at. The first thing that we should have done is, and something which I always keep doing, is the, and in, in market, it's a propensity to consume that is a, that, that's a major uh, driver. Uh, uh, after I got your paper, and since I had problems with some of the analysis, one of the things I did was to look at the number of ailments reported by people in different states, because that's a starting point. If I don't recognize my situation as uh, uh, sickness, I won't access care. I mean, the rest of it follows from there. Uh, whenever your researchers have time, just take a look at this uh, table. That is the, uh, the the number of ailments reported per thousand persons, rural and urban, and that to a large extent determines the combined expenditure. That is not uh, private, not uh, 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 not government. The overall size of the market starts from there. The second part is is another t another question on the NSSO where they are asked. Did you, if you did not access treatment, why do you not access treatment? And there again, the once you keep take that question about, you know, about ailment not considered serious, take that out. The rest of it is what matters to a policy maker. That's what I used to look at, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as health secretary. If, uh, let us say, uh, let me just uh, pull that out. If it, uh, if it says that uh, uh, <clears throat> quality is an issue, 
then we have a problem. Then, then, then that's something that, uh, that you need to work on. But uh, if uh, too much of crowding is a problem, then the solutions are different. So uh, just imposing a linearity between uh, GHE and, uh, and uh, consumption pattern is not correct. And again, as Dr. Giri just said, as someone who has analyzed uh, Kerala's health budget from 1960 to 1990, you find that the political economy of decision making, which kind of drives investment to areas that are co considered important for people like us, elderly male, you know, that and, and, and very clear pattern you will see. The investment will go into what is considered important for, uh, I mean, for, for my age group, uh, especially the males. So, so that political economy kind of determines how the money will get spent. So to, to imagine that this, this, this whole thing can be determined by, uh, by one or two variables is, is being too simplistic. Having said that, <clears throat> if there's a demand for healthcare, what uh, Mr. Mr. also mentioned, if there's a demand for healthcare, it has to be met. So then what will happen is that if the demand grows over time from 2004 to 2014 to 2018, the size of the market bulges outward. And then what you will see will be, as you have pointed to your study, if even if the government health, health expenditure goes up, the private will also go up. Because if, if X was in 2014 and 2018 it became 2X, if, and why is the is the is the government uh, investment? If it to keep the rate as it is, and and and, and the private sector will be x minus y. So to keep by the time the total size of the market goes to two x, for to maintain the same proportion, government expenditure has to go to two y. But even then, two x minus two y would still be greater than y. So so that's 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 bound to happen. So. Uh, a simplistic analysis is not uh, not not uh, 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 what I would recommend. It's more determined by the, uh, uh, the, the, the 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 way the market behaves and the propensity to consume will certainly determine increase in expenditure in both government and private. That's my uh, take on this. Thank you. Thanks, Rajiv. We did make a reference to that actually when uh, Girija spoke exactly the point you're making. And in terms of the linear linearity, uh, before you came, we, we did mention that as a caveat that we do recognize that there are many factors. Um, so point well taken. And and we one more one more small thing. We, when we look at uh, when we look at the growth of uh, uh, health expenditure, you'll find that again that doesn't grow in the same way as let's say CPI grows or even WPI grows. It'll always be higher. And there's also a certain amount of you know, exponential growth that happens because as people's familiarity with healthcare goes up, the demand for more complex and uh, complex treatment will happen. So as you go higher, which is what I've been arguing with uh, uh, the likes of uh, Mr. Mistra, don't say Kerala is well off. Kerala is in a bad shape because the demand for complex care actually makes our life more, life more difficult and, and, and the changing demographic and epidemiology profile. So, uh, so the... So the, uh, uh, when you do well in one sector, the demand for healthcare is bound to go up. And mind you, it's not determined by need. It is determined by demand. And the demand is up to the consumer, not to a rationally, exogenously determined standard. So the way the market will grow in health will be like the way uh, demand for luxury cars go up. We started from Maruti, now everybody, everybody wants a, what is it? BMW, BMW X7, you know? <laughs> so, so, so that, so that, that graph changes, the, the, the pattern of growth changes, we should uh, take yes, that also. Surrounding Bihar, okay, I'm saying the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, enough UWs in Bihar also yeah. I've seen. <laughs> okay, we're going to move away from Bihar and uh, being surrounded by Caroline and TN. So, Nachiket, uh, given the discussion that was just happening in terms of, you know, market forces influencing the expansion of the market and who goes where. We've seen that rising economic levels see a movement towards greater use of private facilities. We've also seen that um, uh, states that are economically better off have a higher component of GHE. Now, one, um, one repercussion of a higher GHE could be that you are improving the public health system and pulling people into the public health system. If that is not happening, another outcome of high GHE could be that your improved public health system is creating a competitive environment for private facilities. Um, do you see this anywhere? 
And um, if it's not happening, why is it happening? And if it's happening, where is it happening? Sanjay, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, come in. One thing I must say I'm very impressed with is the, you know, the kind of questions and debates we are having. Without the data and the analysis that was done, you can't have that con conversation. So I, I do take Rajiv's point that we need more complexity in the analysis, but I'm really very pleased with the very high focus on data. We've not seen this, I have not seen these kinds of conversations happening uh, at Fora. Most people are giving non-evidence-based opinion. I'm one of them as well. Uh, now there is evidence to anchor it to, and you have to ask, you have to answer these questions much more carefully. Uh, there is a, fortunately in India, multiple natural experiments in progress in each state. Uh, and I think using this kind of analysis is going to be quite important uh, to uh, show it. I do want to talk a little bit about Himachal since hmm. you told me to focus on it and I spent some time looking at it. Okay. Uh, you know, I know that's not your question. but No, no, I want to come back to Himachal, but go ahead. I was going to come back. Definitely want to move from Tamil Nadu to Himachal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kashmir also would be good to me. So, you know, one thing interesting about a state like Himachal, and I've really enjoyed the conversation that I've heard so far. These are the people that made policy in real time. And uh, it's really quite, you know, insightful to see how they are thinking and why they are thinking about it. Uh, Himachal, I was actually very fortunate to be a member of a commission led by Dr. Bahan, the late Dr. Bahan. Uh, and we had Dr. Vinod Paul as vice chair and Vandeep Gularia as a member. And it's a puzzling state. You know, uh, because, uh, it, you know, one of the papers that we published recently uh, shows, somewhat shows is too strong a word, but, you know, it points or hints at the fact that many states in India are actually already spending in government expenditure enough for UHC. There are 14 states that we feel uh, are already spending enough. Uh, but certainly it's a puzzle. Why a state like Himachal that is spending according to our analysis, more than enough money on healthcare from government expenditure. Uh, it doesn't have the kind of, you know, one could argue Meghalaya, Nagaland, they may be spending enough money, but the underlying poverty is so high that health indicators don't improve necessarily because while Sir said that IMR, you know, maybe has not had, private sector has not had much of an impact, I would submit to you that actually the perinatal component of IMR hasn't really moved that much in Bihar or UP. And that is actually the only thing the government system impacts. Uh, Post-perinatal IMR, particularly NMR, within the first month, is all private sector. Because of excessive use of antibiotic, you've seen the post-perinatal IMR collapse uh, in states like Bihar. Uh, and really, much of the IMR decreases post-perinatal. Uh, perinatal IMR has not fallen. Uh, because actually the government system, and there is a nice paper you might have seen from uh, Dr. Subramanian and others uh, that does a counterfactual analysis using some clever statistics of what would have happened if JSY uh, was not there. They argue, I'm not a co-author, so I'm happy to, you know, have you attack it. But, uh, you know, they argue that actually IMR would have fallen faster in those states uh, because women were sent to unprepared facilities and ill-prepared facilities. Um, in in uh, uh, Himachal, you know, uh, the reality is there is enough money, everybody is doing everything uh, correctly, there is adequate expenditure. Why are we not seeing, you know, one is that outcomes are stuck uh, because one could argue private or public, why does it matter? Well, in Himachal, there is no private, it's mostly public. Outcomes are stuck, the daily rate for Himachal is stuck at 27, 28,000 uh, per 100,000. My own sense is that in these 14 states, in Himachal included, in particular Himachal included, uh, the real challenges are not to do with money, as many have pointed out. It seems more like a design issue. Uh, this idea that, you know, uh, Dr. Zikhe Mishra also said, Madam also said, that when people are given a choice, they might make different choices, and why should we constrain that? I think that's a core design flaw that we allow people to make those choices uh, because most high-performing health systems actually take away their choice. If you see France and Germany, I have a paper on this that looks at why virtually identical countries, France is spending 10% less and getting 10% better outcomes relative to Germany is that they don't have the choice. 
the people are forced to go to a primary care facility that has been chosen for them or they can change the choice of but in a limited set over a limited time they can't go to any other facility without actually having gone through the system none of the high income states today have that reality and in fact one of the issues that we are stuck with in these states including himachal we built a health system for mnch this is a sri lankan problem once mnch problems got taken care of our systems don't know what to do and much of the expenditure is coming from ncds is coming from if you see himachal today number one ischemic heart disease number two copd one could imagine why in that khuli hawa of himachal why are people getting copd the copd is driven by in home uh, smoke uh, and uh, heating mainly uh, that is a big issue and wood usage is the main issue if you take out wood and even substitute it with uh, other forms of uh, fuel which is drier you don't get this uh, broadcast of actually not so much smoke ma'am particulate matter poorly burnt wood uh that is driving uh, copd they have lots of primary care in fact one of the issues that we pointed out in that commission's report is that himachal is one of the states that you said primary care is important they overdid it you can see one facility from the next facility uh largely empty not many patients uh, in these facilities uh they also i feel on the mnch front perhaps not done enough if you look at for example a marker of c sections uh as an availability of care particularly since private sector is not there uh you don't see many districts that have crossed i would say the 20 25% mark there are many at 6 7% 8% they're not as Bih as bad as bihar up chatisgarh uh because i in kerala or on the other side of the uh, i would say kerala more so than tamil nadu but uh, indeed I'm yes yes getting there it's getting there yeah yeah you're right but actually himachal many districts are on completely the wrong side of course people like up and bihar i would say i would agree with sir that perhaps there is investment in hospitals taking place but actually the data is that government is more urban in terms of its focus on hospital investments than the private sector in fact it is the private sector investing in rural areas in up and bihar uh government investing in the public in the cities so if you see lucknow c section rates in the public sector they are through the roof but if you see uh c public sector c section rate in uh, uh the other districts of up and bihar they actually uh, quite low himachal has continuing that problem a little bit that you do see not enough investment in mnch so then the question is gaya kahan paisa because if they are spending enough money for uhc i am pointing out deficiencies in ncd care and mnch care my sense is in himachal is one state excessive investment in non used primary care uh, doctors are sitting there facilities are there but it's not being used because part of the problem and i i, I think uh, ma'am said or somebody said merely relabeling one thing to another thing is not going to help in fact the modern definition of primary care <coughs> uh is changed from opd because that's a mental image of uh primary care to even in curative man even in curative going out there and making sure it happens uh you know for example if you see uh, i work a little bit in mental health uh, bipolar disorder uh lithium which is a 1949 drug relatively few side effects uh, quite efficacious 60% of bipolar disorder patients go off medicine uh within a few months of starting it good primary care somebody is sitting in your home and making sure uh and the best example actually that i cite in one of my papers on primary care is iran uh iran actually did not and particularly post 1979 revolution did not imagine primary care is clinic based it imagined primary care as being out there uh and in ensuring adherence they in fact took the view that diagnosis is simple diabetes you can tell fairly quickly yes random blood sugar should it be this or that broadly speaking you know what the right answer is right it's really adherence and making sure you were actually examined and i think himachal has not done that himachal has built the old style primary care ki ma agar labor mein hogi to zarur aayegi uh but actually that's not good for ncd care and i would submit to you this is perhaps the problem both tamil nadu and kerala are facing 
that uh, they have high government expenditure, uh, high out of pocket expenditure, but out of pocket expenditure coming a lot, lot of it from medicines and other things because for NCD care, actually it is indeed what you need more than meeting a doctor. Doctor se bar bar milke aap puche ho kya? Diabetes to jab hai, to wo to hamesha rahega. You have to now actually consume medicine and the only way to deal with it is an outward oriented primary care, gatekeeping, making sure you cannot bypass it. Um, and I think these are missing uh, in Himachal, which is why you see government expenditure going up, uh, but not enough uh, reduction in GHE and uh, in OP and not enough reduction in DALIs, uh, health outcomes. The OP is second highest in the country, actually. Yeah, I mean, because the reality is in CDK, if I have COPD, for example, I need salvatamol and I need it for the rest of my life. The thing about these diseases is they're not curable. You need this medicine again and again and again. And if no other system is willing to provide it, you have to spend it. In fact, you know, I have a new paper that should come out any day now in which I argue that the pharmacy is the most important primary care provider. Neither the quack, nor the government, not the solo private provider. It is the Dawai Ka Dukaan. Uh, that is the number one provider of primary care in this country because that's indeed the that's where the medicine comes, that's where and you know France which is what has used pharmacies as primary care provision has 35 pharmacies per 100,000. India has 65 pharmacies per 100,000. Of course Bangladesh is even double ours. Uh, so it's a high density of primary care providers uh, which have a refrigerator, which have amoxicillin, which have is a very nice study for the district of Ujjain that looks carefully at actually hai kya? Uh, actually, kafi kuch hai. there's a new study that Anushka and team did for Orissa that, you know, we were involved in. Uh, again, it finds uh, this to be the reality. And that is the channel that is producing OOP up, not necessarily helping everybody uh, because the alleys are still high. Uh, and um, I, I'm excited about Himachal mainly because I think it offers a real opportunity uh, without the distractions of the private sector. Uh, to try and but fix the it. Public sector doesn't offer free drugs. Um, our OP expenditures are very high in the public sector. That's, uh, yeah. that's, that's uh, the yeah. yeah. Because the reality is that public sector's conception is mini hospital. If you're sick, you come to me. I don't go to you daily to get my medicine, and nobody comes to me to say because there is a lot of undiagnosed disease. Why is ischemic disease mortality high? Because if there was all being taken care of the OP, disease burden should have fallen. Yes. Financial protection level would have been low because people are spending money. Unfortunately, these states are delivering lose-lose on both. I'm getting poor outcomes and high OP. No, there is an interesting question in NSSO that says what proportion of care was free in the public sector? Tamil Nadu is the highest, 94%. So th that variable is also there. One is I totally agree on the demand side. People don't know they are unwell enough to seek care and they are going to the pharmacy for day to day. But Tamil Nadu, over all the NSSOs from the 60th or 52nd round, have been showing above 90% of people saying they get free care in the. Uh, it's been a policy. Yeah, yeah. Free care, care, including drugs. Including drugs. It says if the, the question is free. Uh, I think the word includes drugs. I take out the question. So it's it's interesting. I don't I don't think it's an answer. It was just a policy point. Um, thank you, Nachiket. How much money is spent on outpatient care and primary care? That's the question. Yeah. So, Girija, I want to actually repeat the question that I asked Nachiket to you, uh, which is given that Tamil Nadu has a strong public care system, public system, uh, in what way is it creating a competitive environment from the private system? Because just going back to the conversation, I mean, clearly there are two schools of thought even here. One believes it doesn't matter whether it's public or private, which is true, as long as it's not impoverishing, as long as the use of the private system is not further impoverishing people. Uh, but the other school of thought is that actually it is the public system that needs to be the stronger in order to deliver effective health care. Um, but if we were to put that aside for a moment, my question is, in what way has the, the strong public system in Tamil Nadu uh, created a, a competitive environment for the private healthcare providers in terms of, let's say, bringing down prices of drugs, etc. Uh, let me start with two things. One is access, and the other is affordability. I think there are two, uh, the two axes of you, one of the two of the three axes of you. So we have two clear 
questions here. One, he says access should be ensured. We also think affordability should be ensured and ultimately coverage should be of the maximum number of diseases should be ensured. So there's really not two schools of thought. There is one school of thought. Uh, as regards Tamil Nadu, definitely the presence of the private sector, uh, 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 just the presence of the public sector strengthen the private sector. We've done an early study, I, I think when I entered the, doing these kind of studies, 20, 25 years ago, we did one in Pudukkote, where we found that where the public sector is strong, the private sector is strong. This was because doctors from the public sector in Tamil Nadu can do private practice. So we actually found every town where there was a good hospital actually had private sector clinics. So it's it's sort of a conundrum that you, you can, if a state allows the, the government doctors to do private practice, we actually find that both develop Oh, and as we built up our insurance scheme, one of the side effects which has happened is a lot more of smaller hospitals uh, which came in for insurance but are providing other types of services also. Uh, does it bring down prices? Now, Tamil Nadu is a case that proves it does not because mm -hmm. I think it is partly also the story which, which uh, uh, Rajiv said that as you increase the demand for services, the need for better and better BMW type of services, you want to save your life. I, I think you will go for the best MRI, the best, because we did find, for instance, one of our examples of a strong public sector bringing down price is when we started, the Tamil Nadu Medical Services Corporation started diagnostic services, paid diagnostic services. It was just in the public sector, but it was offered to everyone as well. We brought down the price of both ultrasound and CT as we introduced it through the public sector. That is, we, we created what is called a base price, which the public sector, which was then charging uh, enormously brought down. That's an example. That it happened long, long ago. But right now, if you see, for instance, Tamil Nadu, it's stark. I just have to show it to you. Well, between the 71st and 75th round, the inpatient cost in public sector was 600 rupees for medical costs that actually came down to 484 in the 75th round, medical costs. But the private sector, Tamil Nadu, is one of the highest, 27,228 going up to 35,581. Ma'am, one question to you. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt your yeah. narrative. Sure, sure. But just based on what you're saying, yeah. one of the benefits Sri Lanka has had, yeah. why Sri Lankan economists don't worry about their OP as yeah. much, because they argue that it's progressive. Okay. That's which is that the poor, so the they argue that this produces natural queuing, which is the poor get free care, they wait. The okay. rich are the ones that are driving the OP up. And so we should not be as concerned about it. This is, again, as uh, as uh, uh, Sandhya also pointed out, we've done enough equity studies on this. And we would be happy if the majority of the poor are going only to the public sector. That's not happening. No, they may still go to private. Is the so aggregate out-of-pocket expenditure have fallen? Also. We have actually broken down per capita OOP in each quintile. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately, except for the lowest quintile, the private sector OOP continues to be through the roof. Yeah, we've yeah. done that. And Dani, I don't think your mic is on. Yeah, in Delhi, we find that actually set up their clinics and same, na? because the trust factor is very high. Yeah. So we in a way, they have a catchment population. They where have all that, but I think Rajikhan's question, I answered. I have the analysis. And the first quintile alone, we also worry that might be an access issue that some of them are not knowing that they're unwell. But second, third, and fourth quintile, uh, fifth quintile, all the four quintiles, the. So it's not progressive. No, saying. it's not. Pro it is progressive in the sense that public sector is largely used by the poor. If you want to present a, a benefit incidence analysis, it shows as progressive. But if you actually break down per capita OP, it is not progressive. We also found that actually the gap both for Tamil Nadu and Kerala is very little but between the poorest and the richest quintile. So the with this, uh, well, acts, well, private sector does build, there is some sort of thing that we have a strong public sector, there will be demand created, probably awareness created, people will go. We are not now provided that much competition in order for people to move across when the cost is too high or for the public sector to, for the private sector to actually moderate their rates because the public sector is offering them competition. That is not happening. That has not happened even in insurance, even in the, those diseases. We haven't proved it with data yet, but within the NSSO, if you look at people covered by insurance and not covered by insurance, we are not seeing that fall off. OP even for mm. inpatient care. So mm. something, as he said, it is a design issue. What he pointed out is correct. We built our PHCs for uh, for MNCH, RMNCH, and uh, the work there is now slightly different, and they are really not equipped. We now have a program called Makkalai Teli Go to the houses for NCD care. 
I'm, I'm also working with an evaluation of that. And it is so tough to do. It is, uh, and, and he was just mentioning TV. We, we know the answers of TV. Yes, uh, we, we've seen TV. Uh, we feel from our heart about Tamil Nadu's performance in uh, TV. I don't think that report even is out. We did a state level survey. We went out of the way. We spent money from our own resources. Uh, TV survey nationally is done for the country. We felt that unless we see district level data, it won't be used for policy purposes. So we did a state level survey. We have we have uh, we've kept it in hiding, or at least <laughs> the government now has kept it in hiding, because it shows that it is not enough to have a robust health system. As he says, you need to take it out to the people that need the service and you need to get the service done. And we are all at the stage where the BMWs are running, but we are not able to get the cycle rickshaws going. Well, uh, there's there's a TV was always a problem right from 1998. Yes, I guess why, why, why the issue is, we can discuss it later. Yeah, we'll discuss it later, definitely. But what I'm saying, I'm just saying that the public sector, a strong public sector does create demand. It also creates infrastructure in the private sector now also thanks to insurance. But it has not shown itself in providing low cost, affordable care. So I am on the board of now two, three trusts which do health care. We struggle, we almost die. Without uh, donations, we wouldn't exist. We are not able to balance this concept of affordable care. We, we, are, we don't even know who we are competing with, but we are not able to break certain lines because we are trust hospitals. We, we I mean, we are not uh, dead yet. I mean, thanks to Corona, actually, we did a great job in COVID and our hospital is now, I work with VHS. We, had, uh, we have come out of the red and we are in the black, but what I'm saying is that the concept of providing affordable care uh, as well as quality care within a system is much more difficult than it looks. But so, your cost is holding. Huh? Your cost uh, from 71st to 75th yeah. in OP and in IP is holding. I can stay stable. It doesn't go up. For the, you're talking about OP or what? OP. No, OP has public it's not. It's a uh, public sector has fallen and private sector has gone. Private sector has gone through the roof. Hmm. Public sector is holding because we, we, we our drugs are coming at affordable cost. As he says, there's been some, uh, we are not doing as well on the drugs and diagnostic fronts as we can because newer and newer technologies are coming and pulling out people from where they come from. So I think the presence of a pub public sector, as he says, gives us an opportunity. Uh, I think Rajiv, myself, and CK are all retired, but we are all hopeful people. <laughs> we are not cynical, and we believe that there is hope in it. And, and we don't we assume responsibility for what you are doing. That makes it. We are so <laughs> relieved. We are so relieved. That's why we are all here and smiling. <laughs> oh, something I should uh, said in the beginning itself. You know, 2018, for which Kerala's assessment has been done, there's a conflict of interest. I was a health secretary at that time. So, so whatever <laughs> I. Defend or praise will actually be blowing my own trumpet. So conflict of interest. Somewhere. But what I'm saying is the point is true that there is hope. There is a, when there is a system only when you can talk about uh, what he's talking about. And I completely agree with him that people have to know, change the the, the narrative completely. Take uh, identify the main diseases, take it to the people and make it work. And his question on if you have a good health and wellness center for three one and a half years we ran in three blocks IIT Madras ran. We here means IIT Madras. We ran an ex experiment and we actually proved people will come if we offer them basic services. Mm -hmm. And we changed, we were able to reduce cost and we didn't do any, no rocket science. We did not offer all the services which Government of India promises. We offered just basic out, uh, uh, outpatient services there and referral and preventive care. And we actually showed a, a complete transformation, but unfortunately, as he said during the election, it was not at all exciting for the state government. So they went over and they announced mini doctor clinics, which was exact opposite of what we had done. Which was a which was a, a paramedical trained worker yeah. based clinic. Thank you. And one question, Thank just you. sorry to just ask, although also one thing that has changed in Tamil Nadu, but not so much in Kerala, is access to credit. Uh, credit. credit. It's possible credit. that with the credit constraint removed. People can borrow at low incomes and go to private. And go to private. Maybe that's why you're not seeing because uh, what you're describing. We haven't yet seen it in NSSO. So because NSSO does look at source that's of right. source of financing, we have not seen that shift happen. But that was still 2017-18. So, but we do see it in reality. We see it in our maid servants and all that. Healthcare is one of their main causes for uh, borrowing. Yeah. So, but they're not borrowing from the markets. No, they're borrowing from home home loan sources. No market or non-market, but the reality is they are borrowing. 
from somewhere no, the credit uh, constraint is gone. No, but it will come out because there is a nice question there which says what is the source of it. Source yeah. of it. Thanks. Thank you. I want to move to Mr. Mishra. One of the slides that we showed at a national level was between 4 and 14 OP went up, but there was a drastic reduction between 14 and 18. Uh, again, there can be two schools of thought here. One is that utilization of public facilities, both inpatient, outpatient, went up considerably, so that could have contributed. Um, yeah. Uh, but there is also a school of thought that's looked at data on overall consumption of hospitalization and shown that actually that reduced. Um, which makes a case for perhaps there was foregone care. Uh, this was the time after, just after uh, demonetization, etc. What are your thoughts on what were the main drivers of the reduction in OP? And I'm going to look at Indranil because he's done some of this work. Indrani has been looking at this question. So you should also both feel free. But yeah, but first to Mr. Mishra. Mm. Thanks, Indy. I mean, before I get into that, let me just quickly respond to a few issues. Thank you, Nachiket, for that excellent perspective. You know, what I like best in your statement is that MNCH done, what next? This is the dilemma that public policy is facing today. When the 2017 health policy for the country was being written, days and days the debate was on only two things. One was whether to put 2.5 of GDP or not. <laughs> or the second was what? what to do. And nobody knows where 2.5 came from. Huh? Nobody knows where two, that number 2.5 came from. You guys, nine is mine. You guys came yeah. up with that number. No, no. Yeah. The, this 2.5 <laughs> came from all kinds of analysis, which I don't know <laughs> what data was used. But the country is stuck to 2.5. We... Incidentally, now, now that she's asked it, the Prime Minister asked me, he was not in favor of, you know, immediately saying that this will be a guarantee of 2.5. So he asked me, hmm. how have you arrived at hmm. 2.5? I was, was as the fudgy then as I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we learned. <laughs> so anyway, let me just uh, answer that. There were two reports that came out. One was the report of the high-level expenditure, uh, high-level advisory committee, HLEG. led by Srinath Reddy, huh. Dr. Srinath Reddy, and the other one was the uh, uh, Sujata Rao's uh, yeah. work commission. Macro, 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 macro economics. Yeah, these are the two reports in which so this number I, I saw for the first time. They so were also referred to some other reports. It's not no one has calculated. Anyway, now check it. See, two point five is good enough. Let's reach there first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so now, you know, to your second issue, Najiket, I have a slightly different point of view. Not so much in terms of statistics and arriving at a decision because you have a set of data before you, but more as a person who's seen how it works in the field. How it works. You know, minds of people who are not too well is not determined in a particular way that we think that health system needs to take care. It works in various ways. So when you say, you made that comparison between France and Germany to say choice versus forced and fully agree on the design part. Yes, it is a design fault that uh, we... But when you say that the results have been much better. We presume that if I am forcing you, I have a place where you can be accommodated. Hmm. In a state like Bihar or UP, for example, where I do not have a place to accommodate you, hmm. I myself don't have a choice. What choice can I give you? No, which is why, sir, I was referring to Himachal, oh, Himachal and Tamil Kerala Tamil and Tamil Nadu. Now, now on I that, fully recognize what you are saying in Bihar. On that question of Himachal also, you know, this overdrive of primary health care may not have resulted in the best possible things subsequently, but at least gave Himachal a much better health life compared to other places. So I, I would not worry too much on that extra wasted expenditure, so to say. But we should have the ability in our policy parameters 
to convert that expenditure and get something better no, out of it subsequently. That's the exciting opportunity. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's. Now, on the third issue of this debate on C-section, <laughs> you know, merely having more C-sections does not necessarily mean a good healthcare delivery system. In fact, I would say having higher than normal C-section is an aberration in healthcare. What would justify that is the survival at birth. If that is improving, you can justify the C-section. If that is not improving, I think wherever the resources for C-section come from, whether it is public or it is personal or it is whatever, that resource we can put to better use if unnecessary C-sections are done away with. So this is my point on that. Uh, access, affordability on health, everybody talks about. Let's add two aspects to it now since uh, he says the demand in Kerala is changing. One is quality. And the fourth aspect which we do not discuss and that is the glaring problem in healthcare delivery is equity. See, access, even where access has been created in rural areas remotely in Bihar and UP, one question needs to be asked, is it available to the women of that village? You know, most of these, so these, these are issues we need to very carefully look at. And I found this very interesting that in Tamil Nadu, private practice of the doctors is leading to a push in both the public health facility and the private health facility. In Bihar, the private practice allowance has actually led to the decline of the public health facility. The reason is that those who are doing private practice hardly go to the public health facility. Absolutely. They expect everybody to come to them. So it, it, it means different thing to different places. That's why I said initially that how the mindset reacts on the ground level is very critical when we are talking about healthcare. So I, I, I always feel that public funds need to be catered to be used differently in different places. And when the National Health Mission parameters used to be set, the unfortunate part was that we thought that the same thing will work everywhere. I mean, much that we tried, we were not able to change. The early days were actually better. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I really don't know how we have gone about this. And to be very honest, that is the only program which has withstood the test of time and done well. It will, Indrani, it will for the simple reason that with the same kitty you are trying to work on something else. Priority, decide me kar parem. That's That's the biggest problem. Now, in Bihar, in particular, this whole issue of hospitalization and reduction in hospitalization is a factor of two things, UP included. One is, much of it does not get captured in Bihar. There's a huge hospitalization from Bihar happening outside Bihar, which many of these surveys do not capture. So I don't know what the data sets show. It does not in no way mean that Bihar is out of the, I mean, into the Nero aspect. No. There could be two situations. A, where you are not capturing the data of hospitalization. And B, where we are allowing for treatment at places 
where our facilities do not exist at places which do not get recognized and therefore do not get captured. The, I still believe that in healthcare delivery, India has moved ahead very much. But we have not been able to do our basics still right. And that is decide who needs what. And that's a, that's a, that's a very complex exercise. No, no. No, Indrani, Indrani has been quietly sitting and noting down everything. Indrani is coming at so, the end, so yeah. that's why she... Huh. And she wants to do the final bouncers in the final over. <laughs> no, but we, we, you would have done all the batting by then. <laughs> so anything else that I missed out? Which you want me to respond uh, to? Actually, you missed out my question completely. What you said was very helpful. So, so do it. What happened between 14 and 18? Why do you think the, uh, the demand fell? Okay. Nine, 2009 to 14. We all know why it fell. 2009 to 14 were years, because you compare from the base, were years which were phenomenal for the health sector. In Bihar, it really turned around, and I mentioned earlier also that 14 onwards we've seen a decline in that, and it is a factor of accessibility and affordability only and nothing else. If you do not make things accessible, this will happen. And if you do a study on 18 to 20, hmm. you'll find the same trend and perhaps a more sharpened trend. Okay, so this leads me, last question to the panel, um, Rajiv. Um, I did say, I think before you came in, that the data we've used is NSS, so the last uh, data set is 1718. Um, there has been movement in Kerala since then, the family health centers, etc. To what extent has that changed the public-private um, utilization mix? No, no, we'll get, we'll get in the Rani. There's lots of time for Indrani, don't okay, worry. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> She's the, the, reason, the, reason, the reason I tried to opt out of this is that once you get me going, then we will overshoot the time. That is why, you know, no. I don't want to. Don't do that. <laughs> That's why I want to do that. Three minutes. See, 2014, and actually what we looked at was a 2014 NSSO data. And I took that to the, uh, to the, to the uh, finance minister, who was my macro professor, and the health minister and said, look, in spite of all the great things we are saying about Kerala's public sector, only 34% of the people go to the government sector. And, and when you look at the reasons for why people don't go, the reasons given was not quality. Quality is even now very low. Quality is considered to be excellent in government hospitals. Reason was that the required specialties are not available and too much of crowding. So I, uh, I said, look, this is what we need to address. And uh, I told the, I mean, and, and our, our finance minister was a great admirer of NHS. I said, do you know the number of people per primary uh, uh, care team in NHS? It is 1498. And do you know in Kerala how much it is? I mean, 32, it, it goes on. He said, how many do you want? I said, I want one for 5,000. I said, forget it. I can give you one for 10,000. So that's what we did. For one, pri one primary uh, uh, health center, we had three doctors four nurses, two lab technicians, and two pharmacists. And, and what Najiget said was the assumption also that we actually go out, proactive primary care for the registered population. But again, so the problem is that we don't factor in all the factors that will come in. The moment we increase the, uh, the, the uh, primary care, what happened was the number of curative cases just went up. The outpatient care just shot up. And because we are offering you know, high-end and I mean, high-end uh, 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 diagnostics in primary health centers like, you know, uh, HbA1c and so on. There's a lot of shift that happened from private into in, 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 into government for mm. those those areas which would suit them. So, if you're getting insulin, they will go get diagnosed in the private hospital, pick your insulin from here, and and, and lots of things. So, so the danger of of policy making <laughs> without looking at the factors and expecting that the condition at T plus one in which um, at T0, at which you design your policy, will hold a T plus one is nonsense. But if you can keep tracking and identifying why why this is happening and then take corrective functions, that works. But the, uh, the, 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 the good thing that happened was that when COVID struck, 
because there were three doctors and four nurses at the primary health care, our first line treatment centers could be managed at panchayat levels. And that was a huge uh, positive spin-off of what happened. So I don't know, I think I bypassed your question, but... Uh, um, okay, one more small thing, one more small thing that... Uh, uh, when I looked at the uh, growth of uh, the health sector in Kerala, after 1975, I've argued in a EPW paper that it was a private sector that kept Kerala healthy. When government withdrew after the fiscal crisis in, in, in 1975, the private sector, because the demand had already been created, the private sector stepped in to, 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 to address the need. And again, because, as Najiget said, because government investment was happening in larger hospitals in cities, these you know, uh, husband and wife teams would move to smaller towns, set up their hospitals. It is these hospitals that kept Kerala healthy. Oh. But after 90s, there's a study that my current organization hopes to take up uh, soon, the mode of financing of private sector has changed. Now corporate hospitals are coming in there and they are they are eating up the small hospitals. So the whole the whole pattern of healthcare is changing and we have not studied the uh, one thing we hope to study because this public data is to look at the investment patterns and many of you know that many of your hospitals are not not owned by Indians. They're owned by you know uh, 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 venture capitals uh, in South Africa, in Hong Kong and so on. Nobody has studied this. So the way the health sector is changing, the private sector is changing, at least in the metros and the southern states, is, uh, is, is something that I think will have a large impact on how health sector will grow and in the state. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope to produce that study and then, then at least the first cut on how that will happen. Um, so before Indrani comes in, although to what you said, Raji, thank you, I mean, a follow-up question could be around the health workforce, but maybe we'll talk about that over lunch. Um, we should take some questions, and then Indrani can um, do her bounces. Um, yes, okay, uh, the gentleman behind, and then... Is anybody also keeping track of questions that are coming Mr. online? Mr. Because we have Moore, you said uh, pharmacy is more important than anything else. So is it possible to have a pharmacy distribution through veins and to reach the patient? I, I didn't hear the question, sir. Could you say you the last sentence again? Yeah. Is it possible to make it reach to the patient, the medicine, instead of going to hospital? He no, he's saying, is it possible to have medicines reach people oh, oh, okay. rather than them coming to hospitals? Okay. Uh, should I respond to it? Before the response, let me say that a pharmacist dispensing a scheduled edge drug is illegal in India. Unlike, unlike in US and, and Japan, where there's a pharmacist, uh, sorry, physician assistance formulary, which the pharmacist can dispense in India, a scheduled edge drug cannot be dispensed by, 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 by the, cannot prescribe by a pharmacist. The second point, the number of, uh, you know, the pharmacies that we are talking about in India is actually a medicine shop because there is no pharmacist in every uh, pharmacy. Overall in India, have, we've done an analysis on the number of chemist shops. It is in the eastern part of the country, one pharmacist is attached to 15 to 20 chemists. So I was making a slightly different point, which is that pharmacist is already there uh, in the community. Uh, this, the, the Ujjain study and the Orissa study point out that the average citizen is not more than a half an hour walk from a pharmacy, a well-equipped pharmacy. Not the, not the medicine shop. No, including the medicine shop, but it all has medicines. The medicine shop is also not empty. The Point of course being made is that are they qualified to do what they are doing? The, the opportunity today, which I explored in my paper, is because we have newer guidelines of telemedicine, we have newer guidelines, and there are actually players on the ground today. There's an entity called Geo, for example, that is working on this on the ground. Uh, it has used the pharmacy as the place where a lot of pre-diagnostic work is done, then connect via telemedicine to an authorized physician and then once the prescription is available again come back to the pharmacy the government has also launched a very nice program which i'm hoping becomes more popular on a diabetes educator which is a five-day program short program which again 
the pharmacy is in a very nice position to operate. And there are actually 40 countries, which you can study you know, through the report, um, which have explored how pharmacies can be turned into powerful engines. Um, Nigeria, amongst poor countries, Indonesia, um, and of course, France has virtually made them full service primary care providers. In our not so successful TB program, we tried to use pharmacies. I think that part really worked. We tried to find out data of which are the people receiving TB drugs so that we could at least contact them, as he said, go after them. As I said, RTB program has much more work to be done, but the pharmacy did provide a lot of information because, our, again, our problem with TB is follow-up and uh, making sure that the people complete their uh, TB treatment. Um, Indranil, you, uh, you had a question. Sorry, before Indranil, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for a great discussion. My name is Parth. Uh, two, two points which I feel not very discussed, very well discussed. One is quality of care uh, and impact on OP, and one is medical education. A uh, few experiences I want to share is I, I worked in uh, CMC Valor. I graduated from there. I was there in Tamil Nadu for eight years. I have received patients coming all the way from West Bengal in an ambulance, coming all the way to Valor for treatment. I am now in Malanazad Medical College. Uh, I am doing MD in community medicine. Around Malanazad Medical College itself, I have seen five informal healthcare providers. Uh, so going out in the community, an uh, informal provider sitting 100 meters away from where I sit. And I don't get those patients, he gets all of them. So quality of care again, and to quote people, they have said doctors, ko baat karne nahi aati. doctors don't know how to talk which again, I feel no matter how much we invest in health system, which brings me to the point of medical education and training, uh, which is uh, severely impacted in our country. And like you mentioned, uh, medical cost is mainly drugs and diagnostics. Uh, now, medicine, in my personal experience, is not as much as clinical as it was previously, where diagnosis were more clinical. Now it's more diagnostic based. So what role does medical education play in this? Because I personally feel it's impacting out-of-pocket expenditure quite significantly. And uh, how do we address that? Um, Indranil, would you also share your question? And then we'll request them to jointly respond. Okay. I think, uh, like, uh, I'm Indranil, uh, very um, enlightening conversation and a very good paper. I think, like, the core part of the paper, I think there is also this element that the NSSO data needs to be looked at the way it, uh, the methodology needs to be revisited. And there is a conversation. And why I'm saying it, apart from many other reasons, I think the ability of NSSO to capture NCD related or chronic care expenditure is, I think, needs to be uh, re looked at because we are seeing uh, we are a country very, where public expenditure is almost static and we are seeing overall. Uh, uh, health expenditure going down as a percentage of GDP, it, uh, there could be a measurement issue here as a, uh, as a whole. Other uh, two quick observations, and I liked uh, Professor Mo saying that choice is something which needs to be revisited, and, uh, and uh, choice and comprehensive service provision go, goes hand in hand, and we cannot depend on choice only. But I think the role of public and private, they are not dichotomous and it has come through and the whole public investment has been to strengthen private sector uh, growth, mar growth of market in healthcare without much regulation. I think we need to look at this also significantly. T why so much tertiary care? Because it's the design to create more specialized care uh, and the market for it. And it's not, I'm not saying there is somebody doing it consciously, but it is, there is that complementary relationship. And we have created two distinct products. One is the public sector where RMNCH uh, services would be provided and people go and know that this will, this public facility in most part of the country will not provide NCD care. So they're not seeking care. So that product disting distinction has been created at micro level and also at the larger level which needs to be looked at I think very systematically. One small observation and I'll close. The role of public investment in bringing down prices, we have seen that in Rajasthan also. Our WHO study when the Rajasthan Free Medicine Initiative came in, and this I quote, all the pharmacies were finding it difficult to make business. They have show boards, 30% uh, uh, like uh, concession on MRP, 40%, and 
वन ऑफ द प्राइवेट फार्मेसी पर्सन सेड दैट पहले तो मुझे पाँच मतलब एक वक्त का रोटी खाने का समय नहीं मिलता था अभी तो मैं पाँच वक्त का रोटी आराम से खाता हूँ इन द सेंस आई डेंट हैव द टाइम टू इवन वन वन प्राइवेट फार्मेसी नियर अ मेडिकल कॉलेज हॉस्पिटल सो दैट इज द रियलिटी इट ब्रिंग्स डाउन प्राइसेज बट आई थिंक वी नीड टू कॉन्शियसली लाइक मेनी ऑफ यू आर सेंग द प्रोडक्ट मेक्स हैज टू बी नाउ रीएस्टैब्लिश्ड एंड कॉम्प्रीहेंसिवनेस नीड्स टू बी ब्रॉड Rajesh, very quickly. That will be the last and very quick question. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, just to add a few observations in line with you know all that have been discussed, a uh, few things that you know I would uh, 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 recommend uh, to be considered on the table if we are looking at uh, the impact of public financing on health is uh, primarily with little investment and focus around regulation. You know both at the central and the state level. especially when we are looking at out of pocket expenditure the kind of prescription practices uh you know or 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 the availability of drugs a little investment around pfm systems that actually govern the you know fund flows and how funds are utilized at the service delivery unit level and investments around that could probably you know help improve the health outcomes with the same set of resources that we have and uh finally looking at a serious work around a, a comprehensive public investment management framework with all the money that's going into capital investments through 15 finance commission through pm abhim and all other sources you know through the life cycle of these investments we do not have a perspective plan and probably that's that's uh, you know i- impacting uh, the kind of outcomes that we are looking at thank you rajesh so thoughts responses very quickly just, whoever wants to respond just one one very i mean most of them were suggestions and and observations but something that's caught my imagination is his statement that doctor ko baat karne nahi aati hai <laughs> now you know one of the causes of low footfall in public, in public sector in many of the states has been the interaction or the behavioral issue between the doctor and the patient mm. and this is something unfortunately no medical syllabus has in built into it i'll give you an example successively for about three times or four times in two months doctors in safdarjung and rml got beaten up mm. by angry attendants very unfortunate and the s- standard response would be overcrowding no facility we can't help i went deep into it and realized that there was a behavioral issue as well mm-hmm. i mean how you talk to the attendant of a patient to whom he is so emotionally attached mm-hmm. and is at the last stage or whatever criticality is very very critical in fact that is why in 2018 we made it mandatory that all chs doctors of central government will have to do a course post their mbbs at nihfw which would be a induction course for them so that we you know get some people to talk about these issues mm-hmm. so it's it's not just and there are various things that impact a person going to a public health facility thank you any please yes? example of cmc velour it's a case in point i mean one is the attitude the overall mm-hmm. culture there is different but i completely agree that if you take western countries for instance nhs with all its problems the doctors are specifically trained in mm-hmm. how i mean they one of their things is they treat the patient wrong it's very serious to indranil's point i just wanted to enforce it what you said about free medicine scheme it was not just government expenditure it was government expenditure in a particular item that will definitely reduce out of pocket mm. so yeah. government expenditure as i said is not a monolith and a scheme which yeah. goes to reduce take medicines for ncds or take medicines to the people will definitely impact out, out of pocket and that's the kind of uh, what should i say granularity we may need correct. to discuss correct. in our correct report. fair point any Yeah. closing just uh, you know quick response is one issue of this medical education of doctors and what they should do see the reality is that these are all market forces operating we can say you know where you will hear many people say you know uh, such and such is important in bihar such and such is important gender balance has to be better men has to be more friendly 
good statements of intent, no actionability. Because you can't do anything about it. These are what, you know, in system theory we call gravitational forces that need to change, but it would take 200 years to change it. The view I've taken in one of my papers is that I feel we have a poor understanding of primary care if we think primary care equal to doctor. In my paper, I identify 17 characteristics of primary care. Half of 13 is the doctor. It's an important component, but it's not the most important component. In fact, the countries that have been most successful, I cite two examples, one from Iran, one from Alaska. They don't use doctors because how will a doctor ensure adherence? How will a doctor ensure, doctor will ensure you came in, I spent 30 seconds, I gave you this medicine. Actually, that's, the journey doesn't even begin there. You know, did you come for the right thing? Did you continue to take your medicine? So I would say we need to think a little bit more differently and in that paper, we report a very nice experiment with a &Ms in Pune, in uh, Maharashtra, Palghar district, uh, that somebody did. Very successful. Thinking about how to make, you know, a, a, a protocol-based primary, and that's the other point was made, right? It's moved from clinical to diagnostics, which means it has moved from the doctor who's a black box AI. We don't know how he reached his judgment. And I cite evidence of massive errors, the UK GP. 70% under referral of cancer, right? Because he's got a population of 1,500 people. How is he going to see all the cancers? Statistics, risk scoring has replaced judgment in primary care. Secondary tertiary care, clearly there's lots more unknowns that people have to respond to. So maybe the answer is not changing medical education for doctors, but actually giving them a very different role, consistent with their instinct towards doctors being medicine people, not people people, to try and see what can be done uh, as a... Uh, this issue, is really you raised about, you know, the public sector having played a role. I certainly believe, like you, that, you know, because in healthcare, you know, people talk about regulation. I come from a finance background, right? I used to also be a regulator for a while um, on the board of Reserve Bank, not directly as a member of the team. I feel we overemphasize what laws can do, what enforcement can do, what punitive action can do. There's a lot of interest in accountability, right? A doctor, ultimately, you want him to be discretionary, voluntary, to have the best interest of the patient. You cannot force him to be nice, right? That, 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 that doesn't come together. And I believe benchmark competitors, is an important. Why does Kerala have a terrific private sector? I believe it is because people like Rajiv ensured that it has a terrific public sector. Because now there is a benchmark. Now, within Kerala, you might see the differences, right? Ma'am is looking deeply at Tamil Nadu, and she might not be as persuaded. But if she looks across, I believe one of the reasons why Bihar has a very bad private sector, because it has a bad public sector. A bad public sector crowds in an even worse private sector uh, because now there's no benchmark competitor. Whereas in Kerala, I mean, what Rajiv said, I have personally experienced also. It's an outstanding public sector, which means it's a true benchmark competitor for price and quality. Uh, but, you know, obviously, MAM's data is an important one. We have to re examine to see where does it have a rule. But I have a strong belief that where states don't have money, even if they build little, like Andhra has done, do a good job of it. Don't try to cover the whole country. Uh, that will pretty crowd in good private sector. Thank you, Rajkit. Uh, sorry, um, no additional questions. Rajiv, uh, response, quick response to the, any of the questions that came in? No? Okay, so everybody is very keen to hear Indrani, so I'm going to pass this over to her. Kusanda, I wish the hype didn't happen, but um, thank you, first of all, uh, Alok and Sandhya for a very uh, thought-provoking paper because I think this has raised so many questions. Uh, so I will talk like a researcher for a while, and then I would go on to actually sum up some of the important points that uh, emerged. I think the title of the paper is, is basically the answer, the state differences and what we have been hearing since the morning, uh, we have been hearing that there are major state differences in how, how the health sector functions. Now, 
one message that should not, and I know Sandha, you have been emphasizing it, should not be taken away from this is that health spending does not matter because it does not impact out-of-pocket spending. Health, total health spending is done for many reasons, one of them being to reduce out-of-pocket spending. So I think we have been hearing that over and over again. Your results are very really interesting. I would just say one point as a researcher that this last round of NSS is not to be believed. Uh, no country has ever shown a dip in hospitalization rates uh, moving forward. So I, I think that some of the results that you're getting could be coming out of there. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you look at micro studies on out-of-pocket spending, I'll just quote from something that I was reading yesterday. The main determinants of out-of-pocket health expenditure are demographics like age, gender, place of living, education and income level, household size and presence of comorbidities. Other determinants were marital status, insurance status, payments for medical supplies and pharmaceuticals and distance to health facilities. I'm quoting directly from a, uh, from a uh, refereed journal article. Now, that really means that if you are going to look at three periods differently placed in time, so many things have changed in the meantime that you actually cannot draw a, you know, a robust conclusion on uh, the, the, the link between health spending and out-of-pocket spending. Because it's not ceteris paribus anymore. Things have changed. Your comorbidities have changed. NCDs have come in. Your demographics have changed. Elderly population has gone up. So there are numerous other things that are coming in between. So that um, while you are saying it's an association, it's not. You're not doing a deterministic model, which is absolutely well accepted. Um, I think the focus on these uh, intermediary factors are, are equally important. So therefore, you are, I'm not surprised that you're finding what you're finding, frankly, because you can't really look at that in, in, in that sense. But it shows throws up a lot of questions. First, government spending is going to impact on out-of-pocket, I mean, will, will ultimately link up with out-of-pocket spending, but with a lack. So your investment today, so the other uh, issue with this kind of um, uh, correlation is that what you spend today, you can't observe a reduction in out-of-pocket spending in the same time period. So in a more nuanced analysis, probably you will need to do some time lag uh, analysis. And we don't know. I mean, this is anybody's guess how many years it takes for government investment to show up in out-of-pocket spending. But sooner or later it will, but maybe moving forward you can think of an analysis where you're able to take into account that time lag because it, it's not contemporaneous, you can't do it that way. The other thing that came out uh, you know, from this in discussion is that out-of-pocket spending matters, but health outcomes matter, I think, more. Because the models of Tamil Nadu, uh, Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, they show that while your private sector is thriving and, and people are seeking care in the private sector, your health outcomes are also improving. So. What should we worry about? Should we worry about health expenditure of the government influencing out-of-pocket spending totally or out-of-pocket spending of the poor? So if we are only going to think about out-of-pocket spending of the lowest quintile of the population, I think that is where our energies should be focused. Because if the others want to pay out-of-pocket, it's a normal good. You know, uh, private health healthcare is a normal good. Your incomes grow up, you are going to seek care in this changing world with technology, etc. But something else that came up again and again is that it's not only that incomes increase your out-of-pocket spending on health, there is a big factor called trust that, you know, so if it's not as though the poor will, if their incomes increase or do not increase, they're not going to go to the private provider. They might because they believe more in the private provider. So there is there are other factors that matter besides, of course, incomes, but incomes do matter. Now, uh, the main point that I was taking away from this is that we saw post-COVID that government health spending globally surged. There are WHO papers to show that, et cetera. And out-of-pocket spending was muted. You know, it did not increase because of the lockdown. People could not seek care. What does that show you? It shows what Nachiket has been saying, that the market was closed, right? So there was no market. So you're health expenditure is growing up but you are going up but your out of pocket spending did not go up now health expenditure of course during covid went up because of all these other reasons including vaccination etc 
But the point is that it is entirely possible for health expenditure in one period to go up and not observe anything in out-of-pocket expenditure. So I, I would say that we have to be very careful what uh, 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 implications we draw from there. The other point is it has also been proved during COVID that countries that spend uh, well on primary care had better health outcomes. You know, it's, it's, there are numerous papers to show that, which really means that spending on primary care is actually, continu it continues to be the main piece in, in all our discussion, especially in India, in the context of our country. So maybe in, uh, going forward in one of, in your, you know, I'm sure there are three, four papers that this discussion will uh, bring out. One thing could be you can focus on expenditure on primary care and see whether that is impacting on uh, your out-of-pocket spending with a lag uh, and also your health outcomes, because that is where the states are very differently placed. And I was actually looking at, uh, you know, health spending comprises your uh, basics on infrastructure, personnel, and your rural health statistics, at least that's only government source that still one can rely on, I'm sorry for saying that, uh, shows huge gaps in Bihar, uh, UP definitely, and in many other states. So suppose you were to invest on personnel and infrastructure today, and whether 2.5 came from whoever, it doesn't matter, but you do double up your expenditure, will you immediately see a decline in out-of-pocket spending? You may not, because you're just you know, trying to beef up your primary care. And, and you have to wait to see what effect it has. In the first instance, it might even increase out-of-pocket spending if you don't have a continuum of care that is well done. So you have, you know, what something that uh, you were saying actually, that uh, if your primary care is well, you know, strengthened, but your secondary and tertiary care you haven't paid any attention to, then obviously it is going to end up spin increasing your out-of-pocket spending. So the second or third message from this discussion was that you not only have to, there is no, uh, I don't think it's really incremental in that sense. Say, okay, we primary care, but we have to think secondary tertiary. You can't do that because that will increase your out-of-pocket spending. So I think the continuum of care, you know, we have been hearing about this sentence for a long time, but we haven't functionally used it, which is that when you invest on health and wellness clinics, you also have to invest on all the other parts because kaha jayenge health and willing wellness clinics so they don't have anything on secondary and tertiary. So that is going to increase, you know, out-of-pocket spending. So basically the point I'm trying to make here is that government has to spend on surveillance, on health infrastructure, on health personnel, on medicine, supplies, um, research, vaccination, all of that. The direct link with out-of-pocket spending would be what you're spending on the health coverage program. Actually, if, if I think uh, you may think of a study where you only look at, let's say, PMJ or health, well, health and wellness center and PMJ and the impact on out-of-pocket spending because that is the direct link of the total expenditure of government with the uh, out-of-pocket spending. Bakito takes a lot of time to work through the system and impact. Ultimately, if you beef up your primary, second, and tertiary care in the government sector, sooner or later, like Tamil Nadu and Kerala, you will see uh, outcomes improving. It may not see out-of-pocket spending improving because as we have been hearing again and again, that a good government sector actually invites a good private sector as well. And there is no reason for us to think, therefore, in states that have a good private and public sector, there is any reason to expect out-of-pocket spending to be lower because that, but if in those states you can study if the poor are actually, uh, you know, not uh, suffering financial hardships because that is their, their objective is to see what is happening to the poor. Himachal's objective is to see what is happening to secondary and out tertiary care going out of a mother and child. Uh, Bihar and UP can do something else because they have uh, missing gaps from primary to tertiary, so they have to invest on in all of these things. So I think I just don't want to take too much time. I want to uh, say and the last thing is that um, one point I wanted to also say is that this quality, people were asking, somebody asked about quality. In states where uh, and a quality could be also design issue, as Nashiket was saying, but quality of care is, is critical and we this is a least studied uh, item in research. I mean, nobody actually studies quality of care. I don't know why that is so, because it's very difficult, I think, to do anything on quality. But whether the doctors are giving less time, more time, 
you know, taking one minute and writing six, uh, di you know, drugs and saying, diagnostic karado, all of this is part of quality care. And uh, I think if you, CSEP can think about doing something on uh, quality as well. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, I would just say that um, we uh, should re encourage state governments, uh, and I was speaking to uh, Girija about it, to do their own surveys. Uh, ANSS is not going to happen anytime soon. We will run out of data sets. Uh, and as I said, 75th was for a flawed data set. I'll, let me say something about national health accounts, because that is something we've also been depending on. See, the NHA has a fundamental flaw, and I'm part of the NHA committee, I'm still saying it which is that you are using the same data to churn out annual numbers. That's internally, inherently a flawed thing because your hospital is, uh, rate is stuck at 2%, right? So kya hoga na? sooner or later you're going to see out-of-pocket spending coming down as a share of governments, you know, in the total health expenditure. So I don't think we can rely for national estimates or state estimates on the on an unchanging set of parameters which is what is right now happening with with our thing so states have to invest on telemed their own surveys to get the right answers on out of pocket spending and uh, health so outcomes we, 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 we should and health outcomes i think last point is that let us also move beyond out-of-pocket spending because I think one thing has been well established that out-of-pocket spending is not the most important indicator of better health outcomes. <coughs> so we need to just kind of go to two points, outcomes and especially outcomes for the yes. poorest. Valid. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Andrani. That was uh, amazing. I had promised Mr. Mishra that we will not go beyond uh, one, so I'm yeah, not going to take time. I'm just going to thank everybody for coming, for being a part of this, and for this very, very rich discussion. Lots of new potential strands for our work. Let's see where that gets us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.